Welcome to Hiraith, a home for the left in Wales. Welcome to the Hiraith podcast. Today we look at Plaid Cymru's fortunes in next year's Senedd elections. Today we are joined by Carrie Harper, uh, the Plaid Cymru candidate for Wrexham in the 2019 general election and for next year's Senedd elections. And, uh, and Mark Hooper, the former Plaid Cymru candidate in the 2017 general election. Hi Matt. Uh, so today guys we're going to start by looking at um, the question of leadership. So it's just under two years since Plaid changed uh, their leader uh, and Adam was elected. Do you know what, what can you tell so far on the differences in their leadership styles? Well, well they're different. They come from different parts of the party I think which is the, the first thing. I think um, Adam obviously won with a, an overwhelming turnout when he when he won the party's nomination and I think there's been opportunities where he's tried to set himself as being you know the thoughtful man of Welsh politics and I think he's come across quite well as that I think the the opportunity now is to turn those thoughts into radical actions and for me um, I supported Leanne in the in the leadership election and I think it's about trying to bring the best of both worlds now so to try and bring that radical edge which work which Welsh politics desperately needs. Um, I think you know every leader is going to bring a different sort of skill set and experience to the table and um, I, I supported Leanne in the leadership election as well I think you know she she's got a great work work ethic and political instinct but then Adam's got that wealth of experience um, as a former MP, his time at Harvard, he's a great public speaker. And I think to a large extent, he's continuing what Leanne started. You know, we saw the membership increase under Leanne, we're seeing it steadily increase under Adam as well. I don't see any fundamental changes in terms of values in the party because of the change in leadership. I think people join Plaid because they want um, to see a better future for Welsh communities, they want to empower their communities. Um, so that won't change whoever's in charge, but. I can say the feedback I got from the Westminster election campaign in terms of Adam's TV appearances was very good. I think people connected with him really well on a, on a human level. He came across as, as down to earth and somebody that they could connect with. So why do you think people, Plaid members, decided that a change is needed? I don't know. Like I say, I think um, everybody, every leader's going to bring a different skill set to the table. Um, for me, Leanne's political compass was something that I really identified with. But then, you know, I can see um, the, the attraction that Adam brought for members as, as well. I just think that they bring different things to the table. We had three great candidates in fairness in that election and any one of them could have led the party really successfully. And I've got, I don't have any confidence in, in any one of them to have done the job. But, you know, I, I think that the signs are very promising under Adam's leadership as well. So I think it's looking very positive. I think there's, um, politics is a tough uh, results game, isn't it? So if you don't see the movement in the number of seats, you're always going to be vulnerable, irrespective of the battleground that you're fighting and I think that's where Leanne struggled in some ways because we didn't see the breakthroughs that you know had been promised a long time in the past but you know the world's changing now and we're in the, we're all doing this on this podcast on zoom we're not in the same room because of a major crisis that's um, enveloping everything and changing politics as well so you wonder whether or not there's an opportunity now for any leader whether it be Adam or from one of the other parties, to make a, a huge breakthrough because nobody is really, it's very difficult for anyone to make sense of this. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a real opportunity. I'm sure Leanne could have done that, but I think now it's, you know, it's up to Adam to, to push an agenda, which is a, an agenda of difference because, you know, both if, if I was sitting there as a, a Labour Party member, I'd be worried about owning covid and what goes after COVID from a Welsh perspective. If I was a Conservative Party member, I'd be worrying it from a UK perspective. And both of those things have got a long way to go. From what I've heard of a lot of Plaid Cymru members about why they chose Adam was the, you know, the question of independence. Adam, on the face of it, appeared to be a much more indie, confident person, talked about independence a lot more than Leanne. Although it seems to become becoming a more popular uh, idea, independence. You know, the S Cymru is growing in numbers. It, you know, it remains a relatively divisive issue. Do you think the question of independence will be a positive or a negative at, at next year's election? I probably would say that, but I think it's going to be the huge positive. I think we're in a situation now where it's clear, without doubt, that being hinged to um, the UK government is bad for Wales, bad for what goes on within our politics, 
and bad for the health of the nation. Increasingly, we're seeing it's the wrong thing, but then you need to make a case to say how we'll be different. And we can't just continue with the same old failed policies that have failed Wales um, historically, and especially for the last 20 years. So there needs to be a break into um, solutions that are more radical than we've had before. But to do that, you know, as I, as I just said, the space has been opened up for it. But you've, you've got to now take that. So this is, this is the time. It's very tricky, though, because in all of this, people, no one likes, in a time of crisis, people don't like people to, seem, to be seen to be playing politics. But this is all big politics. You know, we all know that when England's opening up, that's not for the health of the nation. It's not for the health of the UK. It's not for the health of England. That's to suit Boris Johnson's party political advantage. The fact he's miscalculated and will get it wrong, he will have to bear the consequences of that. And the same thing in Wales. You know, I've, I've been pleased that we've taken a, a different route through this. But are we continuing to do that? Only today we've had an announcement that vulnerable people are allowed back out into the, into the world with no scientific basis. You get the impression that those are policies as well. So, you know, break into that space, I think, create the mood for it. And, you know, we've seen in the last month the amount of people who've joined Yes Camry is the fastest you know, it's, I would argue probably the fastest growing independence movement in Europe at the moment. The, the speed of it is incredible. And that's got to be a bet you would imagine that that was supplied. I think it could also um, suit other parties if they, you know, wanted to truly make change in Wales. Which I think we all are in agreement it will play quite a prominent role in Plaid's campaign next year. Do you think that if that messaging proves to be unsuccessful, the question of independence will be you know we'll go back to sort of how Clyde used to talk about it a few years ago sort of making it a long to medium term aim as opposed to something they want to do straight away uh, I, I think the, the genie's out the bottle with, with independence um, I'm just thinking about my timeline after the Dominic Cummings fiasco and the amount of people locally who were saying where do I sign up you know how do I get how do I advocate for Welsh independence and that wasn't being instigated by us and, and we'd, we'd be the usual suspects locally um, so I, I think, if anything, that COVID and some of the political responses to COVID are, are fueling um, that interest in independence outside of the usual circles. Yes, Cymru was growing anyway. Um, I was involved in the committee that was planning the march in Wrexham. And there were a lot of younger people getting involved with that who maybe wouldn't have walked through a political door, but they certainly wanted to get involved with the independence movement. So I don't think that's going to go backwards and, and you've only got to look on, on Twitter and on, on your Facebook timeline to see that interest and curiosity is growing and actually people are becoming you know quite indie confident they're moving from indie curious to indie confident when they look at what's um, you know happening across the border in terms of COVID. Although Plaid are the primary I suppose primary advocates of independence alongside Yes Cymru they're not sort of the only group. What do you think about groups uh, like Labour for an Independent Wales? Do you think they're good for independence movement or are they just bad for Plaid Cymru? No, I think they're great. You know, <laughs> this if Wales becomes independent, then at the end of the day, the, it's going to have to absorb a lot of different um, political ideologies. And the point of independence is that we're, we're free to travel our own road, you know, and there'll be people from a lot of difficult persuasions traveling that road with us. And I think if people for, from Labour see the benefits of that, and I think, you know, if you're a socialist, the idea of independence should be hugely attractive to you because this is the opportunity to have that blank page, you know, that we, we can reshape our communities based on those types of values. I mean, what opportunity are we going to get to do that? We're not going to get it with decades of Tory rule across the border, are we? So I see that as being a huge opportunity. And, you know, if I, I see that in terms of Labour supporters locally as well who are certainly not closed off to the idea of independence. They're really interested. They want to know more. And I think that um, if the Labour Party is sensible, they will see that groundswell within their own ranks and move in that direction. And I would certainly welcome that. You don't really necessarily want Labour to adopt that position, though, would you? It'd sort of take away one of Plaid's raison d'etres. Well, for me, I didn't join Plaid because I wanted to be a politician. I joined Plaid because I believe in independence for Wales. So for me, um, that's very much secondary. And I think that that would be the same for, for a lot of our members, to be honest. Yeah, and I, I think it should be welcome. And, you know, Labour have got somewhere to look to see where it all went wrong. They only have to look up in Scotland. So they've, their choices are becoming narrowed, I think. 
you know, this, as Carrie said, that this is about change. So if you want to make change happen, that changes the outcomes for people. We're about to hit a situation where Welsh children, four out of every 10 Welsh children will be, will be growing up in poverty. That's absolutely unacceptable. I hope that um, most of the things I say aren't particularly partisan. But I, so I don't necessarily blame individual parties for the situation we're in, but I blame the system. If you want to change the system, that's this is the point to go and do that and you can't do that when we're stuck to a Westminster system that is just wedded to neoliberalism it, it, it will deliver it forever and even you know the Labour Party as it's changed now under Keir Starmer you can just sense that it's a, they're trying to develop a solution that just about keeps the you know, middle England um, set and that won't be good for Wales it hasn't been good for Wales for forever you know we're in a situation where we can we can change things labor for independent wells and other groups i'm sure there are even some independent tories around there as well you know this is about having a situation where we control our own destiny so i think it will start to resonate whatever uh, neil mcavoy's party eventually is called do you think they'll make much of a dent into Pied's vote honestly i i don't think it'll make um, much of a but in terms of the independence movement, as I said, in terms of the question over the Labour Party or, or, or anybody else, then the, the more voices advocating for that have got to be welcomed. You can't build a party around one person. I think this will it will it will it will burn a little fire for the time being. But I think it lacks. I don't, I don't know what its policies are. I don't know what it stands for. You know, it seems to be more closely aligned with those people who are completely the opposite to the way that Carrie and I are talking about the changes we want. So. You know, I, I'm sure that lots of people will be up for the battle, but, you know, whenever the election happens, if it happens next year in the way that we're thinking, which I hope we go on to, I think that'll be the last we see of whatever it ends up being called. It has the potential to sort of hurt Clyde's potential chances of winning in a seat they've targeted for a long time, which is Cardiff West. And obviously, if Clyde are to ever form a, a government, they need to win in places they've never won before. You know, we take the example of Leanne Wood winning in the Ronfa in 2016. You know, it came to shock to a few people. Carrie, what do you think won Leanne the Ronfa? How would you think that can be replicated for Plaid elsewhere? Well, I, I asked her exactly that question, and the answer is hard, <laughs> hard graft, you know. And that is the one thing I would say about Leanne. She's, she is probably the hardest working politician I know. So they did the graft, they knocked the doors, um, they did it one conversation at a time. And they were absolutely determined. There's that saying in Welsh, isn't it? Double donk, <laughs> Adir Garek. And that would be the same um, ethos I would use here in Wrexham as well. You know, these aren't easy things to do. We accept that. But we also accept we're in it for the long haul. But we've got our eyes on the prize. And if you, if you work hard enough, and if you've, if you've genuinely got something you believe in to talk to people about, then they will come on, on board. And, and that's all the Anne did. You know, this isn't rocket science. She worked hard. And um, people wanted that change and they believed in her to deliver it for them. Uh, and that's how she won the wrong bet. The difference this time round is that we'll be, um, we'll be potentially, let's assume that the elections are going like they're planned in May next year. The background to that economically could be hugely different than even we are now. So I do wonder whether or not this, the opportunity for um, a party like Plaid to be able to get in there and force a conversation that wouldn't have happened previously would, would happen. So in the same way as, you know, we've had people uh, and you, you know, in the, when we were talking before we started recording, Gary, you talked about um, people who previously voted Labour, voting Tory in the last general election, mm -hmm. people who are making big switches for, in that case, Brexit or Boris or whatever it might be. I think we're in the same position now that you can have people voting for you who've never voted before. And, you know, one of the key things that I'm really excited about, you know, 16 and 17 year olds are going to vote this mm -hmm. time as well, which, you know, that is a real opportunity to talk to them about something that will be quite different than they've ever had before. And they could they could make the difference. It did help as well that she was one of the most famous politicians in, in, in the UK, obviously, having been involved in the 2015 general election debates. I suppose each party is going to have to change the way it campaigns, as you say, because of COVID-19 and the likelihood that they'll be able to knock doors, but you, you, most candidates won't have that attention, will they? No, I, and I think um, it's particularly prominent in the Westminster election, that lack of um, platform that the UK parties have. You've got that presidential style uh, election going on. The smaller parties, particularly Plaid, don't have that same platform. 
it's it's better in a Senate election. I think there's a long way to go in terms of Welsh media getting that to the you know as strong as it needs to be to make sure people you know understand devolution. I've had to do videos on my timeline explaining to people that Wales is devolved and has a first minister and that that's why they shouldn't be listening to Boris in terms of any announcements on the easing of lockdown rules. And I think it's really shone a spotlight on how ill-informed people are. I think we've all got to take responsibility for that, but there's a real issue there and people not um, having that information to hand in terms of how their own um, country is, is run. You know, so that's a challenge um, that's maybe outside of a party political um, discussion, but I think there's a lot of hurdles there in terms of the, the next assembly election. There's, there's a long way to go in terms of explaining to people just how important those elections are. I think the name change will help having our Senate, having our Parliament and giving it the, the status it needs will help people understand what those elections are about. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, it, it's still a, a fledgling democracy, if you like, and there's a lot of work to do to get people to understand how it works and then to understand how important it is to, to vote for you know, the right candidate in the Senate election, not to treat it as that presidential two-party ping-pong. I, I think Carrie's right that people didn't understand devolution, but these last couple of months, people are starting to realise that we have a there is a difference between mm. Wales and England. I think people have, you know, the amount of people and, and even Tory MPs at the moment who are complaining about cross border issues that wouldn't have been even in their lexicon a, a few months ago. So the world has changed. I think people mm. are seeing you're getting briefings from Downing Street that are explicitly talking about England only things now, and that's because we stood up for ourselves and started to, to, to say that we were different. So I do think that people have probably, they probably do realise more than they've ever done that we are different. So we've just got to capitalise it and push on that, I think, and, and then make, you know, I think there was a really good Twitter thread I, I saw from Mabon um, the other day when he's starting to talk about, actually, we have these differences on a local level for a long time, and people have just, they've, They've suggested they're just postcode lottery and things like that. Well, actually, we should, yeah, being in a Welsh postcode is going to be better for you. It's going to be better for your family. It's going to be better for your health. It may not be the same as it is in England, but that's because we've got different priorities, different needs, different concerns. Let's make the case. Harry, historically, there's been a sort of uh, feeling of a disconnect between North Wales and the Senev. Do you think that's been exacerbated by the COVID-19 outbreak or do you think people are starting to feel closer because of the decision making? I think Mark's right having that spotlight put on devolution and how it works has been um, a sort of light bulb, bulb moment for a lot of people I think they're seeing it in a positive light people have been you know scared during COVID I think they've welcomed that more cautious approach and um, that we've had up till now at least I hope it I hope it continues um, and the fact that, you know, in North Wales, we've been in a slightly different situation in that uh, for the last few weeks, we've been reaching peak. You know, we've been a few weeks behind everywhere else. So having North Wales specifically mentioned by the First Minister, I think has been a positive thing. I think there's still, you know, a lot of um, a, a big issue in terms of the whole North-South divide. It's not going to go away. There's that's all rooted in obviously fair spending and a lot of other issues as well but i think as a general rule that whole idea of devolution is something that's been look, being being looked on more positively positively because of covid do you, what effect do you think the fact that these elections the senate elections will be taking place at the same time as the english local elections the mayoral elections and the scottish elections will have on the ability of clyde to create a distinct space for its ideas um, I think that will depend on um, the strength of the campaigns run on social media. I, I think that's going to be much more decisive this election than it has been in any other one. So I think there's an opportunity to sort of, if there are issues there, then maybe there may not be um, after, after all this. But I think there's an opportunity for us to cut through there. And that certainly, you know, a, a focus for me is looking at, right, you know, everybody's um, got a bit more time on their hands at the moment. How are people communicating? How can we... Um, use those online pa platforms to engage with people in a way um, that we haven't done before. You know, print media's taken a hit during COVID as well. We, we, we don't know what the impact of that's going to be, you know, in the run up until May 2021. But I, I see an opportunity there actually in terms of social media to get our message across. I agree. I think so. This election will, if, if it happens like we think, it will be won or lost on social media and spend will be critical. I think we've got to learn from. 
how people share on social media. So it isn't the initial drop in the, the message in, it's how people share it. And if you just talk about um, how, if you, if you preach to the converted, it doesn't travel very far. What you've got to do is find ways that people go, I agree with that, and I'm going to go and share it. And if that's safety, this issue about safety in Wales, then that's something that we should be capitalising on. We should talk about how we can make Wales a safer place going forward than it is at the moment, because th that's an opportunity for lots of people, I think. You know, other parties could do the same thing, but it's, it's carrying that message across and then making it sure that it's shareable. And I think too often we do party political broadcasting on social media and we wonder why it doesn't travel very far. It's because who, who shares a party political broadcast? But people will share something that says, that talks to them and says, actually, this is something that affects you, it affects your family, affects your life. And you go, yeah, you know, Auntie Jenny would like that. Bang, share, off it goes. And then it spreads. And this is where people like Cummins have got it right. You know, they actually have started to pick up some of these things and they've spread it. That's the real risk in this election, I think, that, and it should be, is that the Tories can put a lot of money behind social media that will come from strange, you know, Russian oligarchs and things like that. We've got to be very aware that these things will be happening. So I worry less about the broader campaign. I worry more about the social media campaign. And that, you know, this isn't rocket science. This is, this is just thinking, how, you know, being very personal about it. What would make you go, actually, yes, someone should see that. And it isn't, it isn't a party political broadcast. I think that's an adjustment for all of us as well. I was, I was doing a Zoom interview the other day with somebody and my, my son said, I said, oh, I've done a podcast. He said, it's not a podcast, mum. You don't talk like that on a podcast. You know, you need to be, you need to just talk as if you're chatting. It's too formal. It doesn't work. And I think, yeah, we, we've all got some sort of lessons to learn, haven't we, in terms of how we do social media. And, and I'm no exception to that, but it moves so fast, you know, we've got to keep up. And there is a real danger of um, being outspent, as you say. But I think as well, we've got that local infrastructure where the Conservatives haven't. We are plugged in on a grassroots level. And I think that could be a massive advantage for us um, for 2021. But it's about honesty as well, though, isn't it? So it's about, I think, when you can, when people recognise that you're telling the truth and you're caring, you're being, and perhaps some of this is about showing vulnerability. That travels over social media much better than this. We've got the solutions. We're going to solve your problems. Bang, bang, bang. We need to be, we need to let people understand that this is a contributory political system. Now, we want people to engage in what's going to happen because we need them to, because I don't think the centre actually fulfills that. So that's about talking about things like how do we have find a more cooperative country? How does Wales get back to some of its roots and, and start thinking about cooperativism as opposed to competition? You know, we're seeing those, those are the things that we're all re re reminded by, by this pandemic. How, does that, how do we talk about that? politically so it's about I think there's depth and the, the one thing that strikes me about the new voters who are coming through is that they're very good at finding the chinks in the armour of things they're delving down so we need to be you know consistent and honest in those um, interpretations and and yeah maybe it is vulnerability maybe it's someone going I don't know the answers but this is this is the, the stuff I think about. Speaking of vulnerabilities do you think that Brexit and Clyde's, you know, very unambiguous remain revoke policy will come back and be a problem for them in the Senate elections. Can I pick on that one for, just because I just led in with that sound, that um, way of getting vulnerability into the conversation. So it's my fault that you've picked. <laughs> um, do you know? I think that this is everything's changed. Everything has changed now. So Brexit isn't top of people's priorities. This um, it may be something that people try and pick up on but i don't think it's the, the the big issue so i think we we move beyond that now as it move on as boris says i mean it was the issue in december no doubt about it but um i just think i agree it's, it's just gone completely off the agenda it's just not there anymore um people's priorities have shifted their focus has shifted um you know towards their health their well-being i think um clearly health the nhs is going to be a massive um, issue post COVID, um, and I think that's particularly true in, in North Wales. We've obviously had the health board here in special measures for the last five years. So I think issues that maybe took a little bit more of a backseat, maybe surprisingly in in the Westminster election, will come back to the fore uh, during the the Senate election. But I don't think Brexit will be one of them. It's quite strange, though, isn't it? So politicians are often accused of fighting 
yesterday's battle at the, at the election you're in at the moment. So I think we need to be fighting the battle ahead and start talking about how the world is going to be changed and how we can influence that change and not just allow, you know, one thing that struck me is the biggest winners out of this um, position we're in at the moment have been these you know, Amazon, you know, Dyson after trying to, you know, these massive companies that don't, you know, that don't care about communities that we're in have been the winners. We need to reverse that and find out, you know, this is the winners will be the people in the communities and how we're going to go and do that. So it's, you know, they, I think there are a lot of emotions that are going to be at play and we need to be picking on those emotions, I think, and making sure that we're back to social media. That's what we'll carry through. I think, you know, there's, in terms of local businesses as well, there's been some positives. Um, there's a lot of people looking to, you know, local delivery services. People signed up with a milkman, deliveries from the local butcher. So in terms of buying local and that whole agenda and, you know, sustainability and hopefully like a new normal post-COVID, I think it's sort of sparked a lot of conversations and ideas as well. So, and that's good to see. That's the one positive thing that I've seen um, come out of it. So hopefully that's something um, that will be a discussion point as part of this election as well in terms of, right, how do we rebuild our economy post-COVID and make our communities more resilient, make them more sustainable. One of the things uh, that is often, you know, made the accusation of Pride is that they are party just for uh, Welsh speakers. Um, the language has been an issue, obviously, when the Angus Robertson review happened, he suggested changing the name of Plaid. Do you still think that there's any hang up about that? I won my council seat in um, a ward in Kaya Park traditional you know stronghold labor stronghold not many welsh speakers live in that ward it it wasn't on the agenda you know i've, I've campaigned locally for over a decade i knock a lot of doors and it's few and far between that the language issue comes up and i think that's because as a group of councillors locally as a party locally they see us out there campaigning they see us um you know, doing the, the legwork, they, they see us at the forefront of all those different local issues. And so they see that Plaid is about much more than, than just the Welsh language. But then again, you know, it's been Plaid councillors who set up uh, the site seven locally, you know, Welsh Cultural Centre. So we're very upfront and open about our support for the language. Um, but I really don't see that as a, as a, as a conflict. Um, and as being somebody who's um, still learning Welsh, I'm not a fluent Welsh speaker, in an area that is only a few miles from the border, but it's not a picture that resonates with me at all, um, that, that line that Plaid is all about the language. And it's, it's not something people raise with me on the doorstep either. I've got nothing to add. I completely agree. I don't think the language is um, a problem for Plaid. I, I don't speak Welsh. Um, I wish I did because all my family do and I doing what they were saying about me. But, um, <laughs> you know, this is, I, it's not an issue politically. You know, you've got um, new, new bars opening up, the spelling wrecks and with a CS. You know, the signs are bilingual. Um, we've got a lot of parents sending their children to Welsh medium education. It's something that's being em embraced across the board, and I think people are generally very supportive. That's good to hear. Um, last year, before the, the general, obviously, uh, Plaid seemed to be doing quite well. You know, we came second in a, a national election, beating Labour in the European elections, you know, polling very well, um, talk about getting over 20 AMs. Now it doesn't seem to be the, the case. Mark, why do you think there's been such a vast fluctuation in applied uh, support in polling at least? I'm actually less bothered about polling at the moment. I think that putting, drawing any conclusions today or last week or next week on how people are going to vote in an election in May next year is, is just nonsense. So I'm less bothered about that. What I am interested in is being able to, like I've said before, is being able to talk into the situation that we'll be entering in um, May and beyond. So we've got a, an assembly term that could arguably be something that's dealing with one of the deepest recessions Wales has, has ever known. And you need to be able to have solutions that can keep, as I say, keep people safe, keep people feeling secure. And some of these things won't be the traditional answers. So I've been along advocate for universal basic income it feels like we need to talk about solutions that aren't the norm and if they don't fit with a uk perspective i.e the uk won't allow us to do them then that's that's the challenge that we need to take on but it needs to be at that level of radicalism i think that fit that talks as well across the piece 
so you can actually have that conversation that crosses device so whichever party starts to pick up on these opportunities will be the ones that, that do quite well so I'm, I'm generally you know I'm pretty sanguine about it and um, most people who I speak to disagree they think that you know these these um, polls are worthwhile but it wasn't you know only a couple of weeks ago the Tories were polling so well and then Dominic Cummings decided to drive to Durham completely blew away their um, polling lead if they ran a poll to tomorrow I think it would it would indicate that who knows what you know Keir Starmer's going to do is he, you know, whatever There'll, something will happen events 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 will change it and the events are happening so quickly um you know if I was uh, if I was in anything to do with Clyde's leadership I would tell everyone don't do anything stupid for the next year I think you know as Mark said the game's changed completely isn't it you know and things are moving so fast you know what's a new story one day 24 hours later it's something completely different I, mean, I think we saw the start of that during brexit and i thought right well you, you can't see any anything more sort of politically explosive in terms of change than the whole brexit debate was and and, and then lands COVID. so i agree that trying to forecast forward in terms of how all these di different dynamics are going to impact on the senate election is really really difficult at the moment more so than it's ever been in in previous elections if Plaid are going to win seats uh, where do you think they're going to win them uh, i think you could argue that lots of places are opportunities, but it, it will come down to, you know, the, the local game at play will be harder in an environment where you can't knock doors. So applied strength, where they've been working hard for a long, long time, and, you know, Carrie's already talked about this, they've, you, they've done the groundwork in places like Wrexham. Sadly, that will matter less, I think, in an, in a, in an election which is going to be dominated by the centre saying what's happened. So I think providing Plaid's agenda is something that is truly groundbreaking. I think it can talk to lots of communities across Wales. I think it can have as much relevance in the South Wales Valleys as it can in the um, the Northwest as it can in where Carrie is in the Northeast. But it needs to be it needs to be game changing because I think people have woken up to the fact that this thing doesn't work. One of the things that struck me about what we've seen for the last you know x number of years of Corbyn's leadership of Labour is that certain things did did hit home people did think things were unfair they just didn't believe that he was the person who could have changed things for them now Adam Price can be that person but he needs to be that person I think it will feel very presidential in some ways and it needs to be you know we need to to get this get this right and how to pitch in those ideas and when to pitch them is going to be you know the million dollar question um well i suppose i'm biased in the sense of you know my priority is making sure that we make inroads in the northeast um that that's what i'm determined to do and i think we've got a lot of candidates now who are determined just to to make that push to get us to that tipping point i think a lot of us have sensed we it's been coming for a long time um and i think this this election definitely could be the the chance to tip it over the edge with, with the right policies, as Mark says. Um, I think people are open to that that message now. You know, if there's a huge groundswell of support for Plaid, then maybe I eat my words here, but it doesn't look like Plaid are going to be ruling in a majority government or necessarily even the largest party, which would sort of allude, give you the illusion that the only way that Plaid would be in government is in a coalition. What do you think that's likely or even desirable? You, you need to set out your stall to win. That's the, the crux of it. So the stall needs to be set out to win. And I, I'm repeat, I'm in danger of going over old ground. But it feels as though if you want to win, you need to be distinct. You need to be different, and you need to be devising policies that could truly be transformative. So in that, that piece of space, I think that there's something we shouldn't be talking about. Um, doing coalitions because if it comes to it and we don't have enough um, air masses to to hold sway and to take the balance of power, then you've got to be able to to look back and say, well, these are the these are the policies that really resonated. This is what worked on the door, and start to get those to be the ones that um, get taken forward into any um, debate. So I, you know, I'm weirdly, and I and I don't think I would have said this three or four months ago. I think it is up to play, but it, is, it needs to be distinct and different. If people are going to be talking about, 
I'm going to develop more jobs for to keep what to keep Wales from poverty. I think that would be a mistake because a it won't be deliverable. B it isn't the way that we solve poverty in Wales. We need to be we need to be truly radical, and Plaid can be that radical alternative, but it needs to grasp that opportunity. So most of the thinking that existed pre-COVID, a bunch of it, I think needs to be re reconsidered and just pitch into where we're going. And you know, I worry for the future of our country because of where this whole thing has taken us. And being attached to this thing that is driving us in, in the completely the wrong direction will damage us a generations and generations to come. So we need to start getting this right. This will be a pivotal moment. If we were in the um, Great Depression and we were in America now, they would, be, uh, in 1929, had they pitched the bold ideas then, they wouldn't have had 10 years of depression. So what are our bold ideas? And they aren't the things that we used to do. You know, I, I want everyone to be thinking, what, what are Plaid doing there? Why are they you know, doing that? And just watch it happen. But it's, it's a tough gig because, you know, you've got to be prepared to say, well, I'm, I'm really scared for our future. And politicians re rely on being able to express hope. There's a sense of people aren't feeling hopeful. People are scared. And you've got to start to think, you've got to recognise that and start to be with them in it. You know, I think, you know, if you look at what Ardennes done in New Zealand, you know, after the terrorist event in, New Zealand, in Christchurch, she actually went down there and she, 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 she was part of their sorrow, part of their, I don't know why this happened. It wasn't about, I'm going to build a wall, I'm going to stop people coming in, I'm going to arrest as many people as I can. It was actually, a, she, she absorbed where they were. And, you know, we can do that in Wales, I think. No one party will have enough seats to form a government. Do you think there's any price worth paying for a coalition agreement, whether that be with Labour or whoever, or the Conservatives, or whoever? Um, no, from my personal point of view. I, I agree with Matt completely. I, I don't think the status quo, quo is palatable for people anymore. I think they do want something radically different. And unless we're going to genuinely put that on the table for people, you know, and he's right, you've got to be authentic, you've got to be genuine and offer people something different and I don't think any options in terms of any any coalitions um have got the capacity to do that you know people want change in Wales that that's the message that's coming back back to me they don't they want to see something different and that's what we've got to be focused on you know if you had to make a prediction on next year's election how many MSs Clyde will return what would you say um, hopefully one in Wrexham <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, like I say, I'm focused on my local patch. I want to get my head down, do the groundwork here. And um, yes, you know, we need to move forward. We need to move forward in places like North East, North East Wales. I'm not going to put a number in terms of, you know, what we're going to do. I think the message is more important. I think people, people are more interested in, in what our post-COVID um, plan is for Wales. You know, have we got something that they can believe in going forward? Can we lead Wales onto that? next step you know and i think i think we can that's the focus okay so without making a prediction then what's it what would be a good night to play no. adam price as first minister would be quite good <laughs> i agree with everything that carrie just said i think that if you live in carrie's constituency you should vote for her i think we need to make it to do listen i'm going to be completely not non-party political in this thing now we need something that protects Wales from bit from the disaster that's coming. Mm -hmm. So, if that, if however that's contrived, that would make me happy. Now, I can't see that coming from the the incumbents. So I can't see that coming from Labour. I can see, so I, there's elements in Labour who want to come up with it, but are they in the ascendancy at the moment, or is Gordon Brown the answer to our problems? That that strikes me as a defeatist attitude, not something that takes us forward. So, you know, the, the change needs to happen. Um, I'd be very, very pleased to see a progressive, truly progressive radical force in charge of the Welsh government into different 2021 onwards. And I think that needs to be, have a strong, if not controlling interest from Plaid Cymru. I don't think it will, ha I can't see any other reason it will happen. I'm, I'm scared. I'm genuinely scared for the future. And if you are scared for this and you do feel that there's stuff coming down that we can't cope with, 
then you've got to build in some resilience and you've got to build in some capacity for, for radical change. And it, yeah, that's where it, that's what we've got to do. Well, I just want to say thank you to both of you for taking part this evening. Uh, if people want to find you on, on, on Twitter, um, what's your handle? What's the best way to get hold of you? Um, it's at Carrie A. Harper. And Mark? I don't do Twitter. Oh, sorry. No, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm Mark J. Hooper. Um, I spend far too much time on Twitter. It's not good for me or my mental health. Um, but there you go. So don't at Mark is what you're saying. Okay. People can, if they want an argument at you know, 11 o'clock at night, I'm, I'm all up for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both uh, so much for tonight and uh, have a lovely rest of your evening.